also means the psychological reversal. And here there was no psychological reversal because you weren't focusing on your own, focusing on your own issue. You understand that aspect of it? Hmm? The psychological reversal is the part of you that doesn't want the emotion to go away. Okay, but you weren't working on your emotion. You were working on someone else's. So we're like we're, we're cheating the psychological reversal. <laughs> you know? It's like we're fooling it into saying, okay, I'm not working on, don't worry, I'm not working on this. <laughs> and by the tapping, we bypass it, okay? And so this can be done in groups. If any of you have groups, you can work with the groups in this way. Now, um, you need to gain some experience in this. First, guiding someone in EFT, and then trying one-on-one, -on -one this kind of asking for inspiration as to what you can say. Okay, so you ask for inspiration, and you let yourself free, and you play. You play. Um, but basically, we're alternating between focusing on the problem, and then stating, making positive statements. Okay, the, the, the burning, I have perfect health. Okay, I have a perfect immune system. Um, I forgive the dust. Because basically it's feeling the fear from the dust, okay? <coughs> and this kind of thing. And of course this is one, if we did another thing like love, rejection, love, rejection, this kind of thing, it would be a rejection of our parents, it would be a totally different issue, okay? I attended actually a seminar in, uh, with Gary on this. We did four days of only this. We were about 170 people. Everyone was... Uh, was a person working with other people. Everyone was a healer of some kind. And every time we wrote down what we felt in the beginning, we wrote down what we felt in the end. When, during those four days, no one worked on their own issue. Okay? And of the 170 people, the mean, the average, was seven in the beginning and 1.2 at the end without anyone actually working on their own issue. Just everyone working on the issue of the person that was in the front of the room. Okay, so this, you have learned three kinds of EFT. The regular EFT, which I would suggest you practice quite a bit. The EFT with choices. And the EFT, which is the borrowed benefits. I don't know why he says borrowed benefits, because you're not gonna give them back. <laughs> So it's a gifted benefits, I would say. Yeah. Okay, any questions about EFT? Because we're going to move on to other subjects. Not at this point, but we're not going to dis discuss EFT anymore. So do you have any questions about EFT? Unless tomorrow you choose to do more exercises on that. Okay. What I want to do now is to show you a wonderful technique to use after EFT. Okay? After, yeah. But you can do it separately by itself, but you can do it also after EFT. It's, have any of you heard of Psych K? Psych K, it's called. No. Okay, it's, it's a method for changing beliefs, and I'm going to teach you a part of that small part, what I consider to be the essential part of that. It's written in your papers, so you can relax. Let me just show you. That is on page 16. You can see one of our students there taking the specific position, okay? Okay, now how does the Psych K work? We choose a belief that we want to strengthen. Now you all chose a belief earlier for your EFT with choices. You can choose that or any other positive belief that you want to install. And then we take this particular position. The right ankle is on the left ankle. At the point of the ankle, not at the knee, at the ankle. That's it. Yeah. 
And then we take the right hand, we place it like this, and take the left hand and put it underneath and unite them. Okay? And then we put them down or bend them like that, whatever is more comfortable. Now we're going to stay in this position and I'm going to guide you in the process. This position enables a flow of energy between the right and left hemisphere of the brain which means that whatever you think about in this position is also installed in the subconscious and not only in the conscious. So what we are doing is we are enabling this new idea, this new positive belief to move into the subconscious. Okay? So close your eyes and relax. Take a few breaths. And now bring to your mind the truth that you chose earlier or some other truth. And it can evolve as you do the process. You are not limited to that. And begin to repeat this truth mentally. Not in an attempt to try to convince yourself. You're simply stating a truth. Now begin repeating that truth mentally. You may find it evolving. And allow it to seep into you. Just as water seeps into the soil. Feel this truth seeping into you. Allowing it to expand and dissolve any kind of second voices or resistance. Keep repeating the truth slowly in a relaxed way, allowing it to seep into you. Allowing it to flow into your cells. Allowing it to flow into your left brain. And into your right brain. that you feel an acceptance of this truth. little more, just feel that truth as an energy. Now, 
Change the position of your feet and put your left ankle on top. And put your left hand on top. Change the, on the left, that's it, okay. And the hands down or folded. And we're going to continue now with visualization. So visualize yourself in a scene in your life, from your daily life, experiencing this truth. It could be with your family, with your work, anywhere. So you see yourself in a certain scene from your life, and you're experiencing this truth. You're remembering it, and you're feeling it in that scene. You are able to experience that truth in that scene. And now, let that scene dissolve and choose another scene from your life. And again, visualize yourself experiencing that truth and that scene. You're in the scene, the same things are happening but you're in touch with the truth. And thus you are at peace. Now choose one more scene from your daily life and visualize yourself experiencing this truth. You're in the scene but you're able to remember this truth and feel it. Now, feel the emotion that is generated by this truth. When you're focused on this truth, what emotion do you feel? And allow yourself to feel that emotion. Emotion that's the result of this truth. And allow that emotion to fall into all of yourself. Feel all of yourself. Okay. Now, you can take your hands and place them like this with the fingers touching and just close your eyes for a little more and feel like you are saving now this truth as if you are created a new file in your computer and you're saving it you're allowing it to become more deeply established 
this truth is becoming established in you. And you can relax. Okay, we call this the balancing of the brain's hemispheres. You can see it on page 16. It's described there. And you can then remember it. And it can be used separately from EFT or as a conclusion to EFT because it allows us then to really go even more deeply into this new, new perception of reality. And we imagine ourselves in three different situations being able to remember. Okay, so we begin to program ourselves. Um, usually it brings a nice sense of relaxation and peace. Were you able, do you able to experience that? Yes. Relaxation. Good. And more than that neutralization, like neutralized. Okay, good. Neutralization, good. Because mm. before I was feeling more irritated. Okay, there are things still moving yeah. around. Okay, yeah, this balance is tough. Okay. It's a good way to finish up. So you should practice that again and maybe teach it to someone. Because <laughs> teaching you learn. Huh? Uh, and it's a very simple technique. And uh, it's very beneficial for getting a new belief. Any questions about that? So you're clear about it? You can do it again? Would someone like to describe it to me? Say, for example, you're going to tell me how it's done. Would someone like to dare? Who wants to try? Explain. What we do. We take the right. No, no, but what what do we do exactly? The process. Yeah. <laughs> we establish the belief. Yeah. And then we take our right arm. Yeah. And then put it over to left. Yeah. And then turn it. Yes. Yeah. Very good, okay. And then we close our eyes yeah. and we repeat, repeat this truth. This positive truth okay. that For we want to Okay. For about five minutes. Establish. About five minutes, okay. And then, and then we take our left arm mm -hmm. and put it over right arm. Yeah. We change it. Yeah. We return it. And then left ankle on the right ankle. Yes. Again, for five minutes, that now we bring up three images now. Oh, sorry. Okay. Second part, three, three images where we see ourselves experiencing, feeling that truth in various situations. Okay. And then at the end, we feel the feeling that that truth creates in us. We allow that feeling to grow. And at the end, we seal it with this. Okay? So, yes? Actually, when I realized that uh, while visualizing, I, I was hearing your voice, but you know, it's like uh, under a kind of disconnected, is it? You weren't actually connected to my voice. Yes. Yeah. It is, and I don't remember I was mm -hmm. visualizing myself. I relaxed and I opened my eyes. Okay. So is this something that you expected to or if I... It can happen. Why not? Everything is... <laughs> everything is okay. 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 Um, I would like to have one last experience. We have about 15 minutes before us, before we... We're supposed to finish at 6, right? Okay. We will finish at 6. Um, what I would like to do, we need to move a little bit and to get out of all of this sitting and thinking. And so do to that, I would like you to, these chairs here, just push them over here, and all of you go to this part of the room and stand across from the person that you did a partner with earlier. 
Okay. So. Yeah. Quick. Okay. Just for the camera, it's Sunday morning. Okay. It's our third session. And I would like to start out today giving you a little idea of the philosophy behind the, my philosophy anyway behind what we are doing okay and then we will continue to close up the EFT and work on the Sedona method my perception is that our true nature is what we call pure consciousness that we are not the body and we are not even the mind Okay? We are what we call pure consciousness. This consciousness has no gender, has no nationality, no religion, no political beliefs, uh, and it has no illness, and it has no fear. Okay? So all of these other things, illness and fear and anger, are actually not belonging to what we really are. In fact, I could talk about what I consider to be the absolutes of our nature. The absolutes. One absolute of our, our nature is love. That we, if, if I experience my true self, I would feel love for anyone. If I'm not feeling love, that means that I'm in fear. There are two, there are two basic emotions. There's love and fear. Every time I'm not loving, basically I'm fearing. How, how would you define love? Love is a total identification with the other being and a sense of oneness with that being and wanting for that being to be happy as we want ourselves to be happy. Okay. Anyway, it's easier to describe love by what it's not. <laughs> it's like, how would you describe God? more by what it's not than what it is. Okay, so there are some aspects of reality which are difficult to describe. But what I mean is that when that person comes into the, my, my mind, I feel good. And I feel happy when I think of that person. And I have all the wishes for that person to have a happy, healthy, fulfilled life. If I have any other feelings, if I have bitterness, if I have anger, if I have hurt or jealousy, then I'm in the mind, okay? And then what I mean is I'm in a belief system which is separating me from my true self. And what are we doing here? We're doing EFT and we're doing analysis so that we can actually begin to experience what we really are. We don't need to learn to love. We need to learn not to fear. It's that simple. When I cease fearing, love is there. It's my natural state. Okay? So, that is for me one of the absolutes. Even if I see an angry person, I know that in that person there is love. And I know if my mind is having negative thoughts towards someone, I realize that that's not my true self. My true self loves that person. Okay. My mind doesn't love that person. <laughs> okay. So this is the distinction I want to make. A second absolute is worthiness. 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 Each of us is worthy, as I, I mentioned this yesterday, each of us, because of our divine nature, is worthy of love and acceptance. As I mentioned yesterday, we may not be worthy of responsibilities or worthy of trust. Okay. But we are all worthy of love and acceptance. And this is important because most of us lose our lives seeking approval. We, we lose our lives. We lose our purpose in life. We lose our happiness. We lose our health. <coughs> seeking approval from other people or seeking approval through our appearance or through our achievements or through doing things for people that we don't want to do, but are afraid that if we don't do them, there's a whole other seminar, the freedom to be yourself. It's a whole weekend seminar. The freedom to be yourself and to make choices and either to do things 
with love and happiness or not to do them. Not to be doing them out of the fear of rejection. It's not a good motive. In fact, when I do something out of the fear of rejection, I'm not really doing anything for anyone. I'm doing it for myself. So if I serve you something and I do a favor for you because I want you to love me, I'm not giving you anything. It's an it's a exchange. We're exchanging. I'm giving you my service. I'm suppressing myself in order to have your love. And this is not love, on my part, okay? So the second absolute is that we all are worthy of love and respect, and there's nothing that can change that. And we can't increase it, and we can't decrease it. That's important. Whatever you do, you're not going to increase how much you are worthy of love and respect. And there's nothing you can do that will decrease it, and certainly no one else can decrease it. Okay. How would you say it in Turkish? Okay. Yeah, ask. If you don't understand, ask. Okay. Um, so, this is a big problem because we have two basic needs, really. To feel worthy and to feel safe. And they're very connected. When I don't feel worthy, I don't feel safe. Why? Because I feel that people won't love me. I feel that I may end up alone. I don't feel safe alone. I'm afraid of loneliness. And also, if I don't feel worthy, I don't feel worthy of God's love or of positive things happening in my life. Okay? So the feeling of worthiness is directly connected to the feeling of security. Okay? So this is the second absolute for me. Okay, we're all loving beings, even when we're not loving beings, <laughs> even when we're not expressing that. Within us, there is love, and we're all worthy of love and respect. The third absolute is that we are all secure. Now, the reality is that there is no physical security, okay? If you're trying to be secure as a body, you can forget it. Because at any moment, this building can fall on top of us, right? At any moment, this microbe can go inside of us and we can leave in a week. Or a car can hit us. So actually, physical security is an illusion. The only real security is the security of immortality. That I am secure because I am immortal. I am divinely immortal. I cannot die my body will pass away, I will continue on another plane of existence. Okay? And this is all religions teach, and all philosophies, and spiritual systems. So that's why I'm secure. But I'm secure for two more reasons. The second reason I'm secure is that life, or God, whatever you believe in, okay, will not allow anything to happen to me which is not for my greater good as a soul in the process of evolution. Okay, so what, what life will allow to happen to me may be nice and pleasant, from my mind anyway, it may be unpleasant, but it will always be the best possible thing for my evolutionary process. And I mentioned to you yesterday the bird coming into the room, and the bird not having any confidence in our motives <laughs> as we approach it and banging itself on the walls, okay? Uh, and that's how we react. When we see something coming to take our security basis, we get very upset. And we even harm ourselves. I mean, I see this happening in Greece now. It really hurts me that it's not enough the damage that's being done by the Europeans in Greece. The Greeks are destroying themselves burning the buildings, stealing from each other. Of course, most of those are actually not Greeks, but foreigners that have come to the country. But, I mean, I see that their reaction, okay, we're not going to work. Well, how, how are you going to make more money if you don't work? Okay, we're not going to, all these reactions towards what is happening is, it's like the bird hitting himself on the wall. 
because I don't see this as the hand of the divine coming to help me to understand something about life and I react against it and most of us react in this way and the third reason we are always secure is that life will never give us anything that we cannot deal with okay we may feel that we cannot deal with it it may knock us down uh, we may get very hurt and upset and we may have pain for a period of time but if we want to and if we use these techniques such as EFT and the other techniques that we're going to be learning and if we use these spiritual truths we will get up again and we'll be fine there is nothing that can happen to us that has not happened to someone in history and that person didn't get up and continue with a creative and happy life. So there's no human experience greater than what we are. More powerful than ourselves as this consciousness. There's nothing that could possibly happen. And uh, if you don't believe that, for example, the books of Ken Kais, who is totally paralyzed. There's another guy, an Australian guy, who has no legs and no hands. Have you seen him on the internet? And they just put him on a table because he doesn't have any legs, doesn't have any hands, and he inspires people. <laughs> he talks to them about self-acceptance, he talks to them about self-confidence, he talks to them about you can create the reality that you want. And he has no legs and no hands, he's like a tree stump with a head. And he's very young. He's young and happy and handsome, and, <laughs> and he gets his strength, of course, from his religious beliefs. Okay. He accepted the fact that I have no legs and I have no hands. He was born that way. Okay. Uh, and he has accepted that. He sees that his mission in life is to inspire people. Okay. We have so many people in, uh, in, our, in our center, a lot of women who have lost their children, which is, of course, I understand, the worst possible experience for a human being. There's no more difficult experience than a woman losing her child, okay, and they're okay. They have come too. They have created a new life based on spiritual perceptions. They have healed themselves from this pain. So there's, there's nothing, and this is where security comes from. It doesn't come from how much money I have or whether I have a spouse or whether I have a house. It comes from these three perceptions. We are all immortal. There's no death. Nothing will happen that is not for my greatest good. Only things that will, are beneficial for me in the end will happen. And thirdly, I can deal with anything can happen. And all of these three truths have to be extrapolated to our loved ones. So my loved ones also are immortal. That's important to remember. Nothing will happen in my loved one's life, including your children, okay? Nothing will happen in their lives which is not for their benefit, and there's nothing that they cannot deal with. So don't see them as children. See them as divine beings. Okay? Now, a fourth absolute, which I believe in, is our innocence. Okay? Our innocence. Our purity. So behind this ego, and behind this mind, is that light, you remember the light of the projector, okay? That light is always innocent. That light is eternal. That light is never affected by what happens on the screen. So there's nothing that we can actually do on the physical realm that will change our innocence as consciousness. And this is, this is what allows us to be one with the divine, okay? So, although our actions in time and space do have their results, okay, and we will experience those results, okay, that's natural, and that's not a punishment for me. I don't see the law of cause and effect as punishment because I see no reason in punishment. We're in a process of evolution. The reason that the effect comes back is to learn from it, not to feel, not to suffer. There's some people who believe in karma and say, okay, I have this karma. If I suffer for 30 years, my karma will be um, exhausted. I will balance the accounts. I don't believe that. You could suffer for 30 lives if you like. 
If you don't learn the lesson, it's not going to go away. The karma is there to learn a lesson, not to suffer. And the only purpose for suffering is to learn how to not suffer. It has no redeeming factors. Suffering. I mean, I don't know about the Muslims and the Jews, but the Christians have glorified suffering. Okay? They even have their God on a cross. And I'm Christian. I'm, I'm speaking from a Christian point of view. So what I'm saying here is that there is no real benefit in suffering. If I think I'm helping by suffering because I did something in the past, that's not going to change. My suffering is just adding to the suffering of what we call the collective unconscious or the morphogenetic field of humanity. I'm adding suffering to humanity. <coughs> what I need to do is to learn from that experience. Okay, I made a mistake. I didn't behave in the way that I would like others to behave to me. Okay, Let's, can I use this as a learning experience? What were the thoughts what were the beliefs that caused me to behave in that way? Okay, find those beliefs and change those beliefs. Then that will be useful. I will have used that experience usefully. Rather than chastising myself, beating myself down because I did this thing, let me use it as a learning experience. Okay, uh, and so but on the ultimate level, we are innocent. And that will never change. So these are what I call the absolutes. Our love is absolute, our security, our self-worth, and our innocence. These are things that describe our inner being and they cannot be changed. The degree to which our mind and body are connected to these varies. And some people are just totally disconnected with that. Okay, and they're suffering either physically or mentally or uh, behaving in ways that are inappropriate for such a being. Okay? Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, when you say that the life won't give anything uh, that you cannot deal with, for example, uh, we, I think we need to understand what the meaning of this dealing with. Because dealing when with. When children die mm -hmm. because something given or whatever chosen, uh, they cannot deal with it in terms of dealing with things. When you say they die, you mean they commit suicide? I'm not understanding what you mean. Suicide or because of hunger or... Ah, no. Or, I mean, Look, there are so many things that a little child yeah, can handle. But death is not a problem because there is no death. Yeah, okay. no, what the problem is for the parent yeah. who experiences that. Okay, that would be the suffering. And the question is whether the parent can deal with that. Because when the soul leaves the body, there's no problem. The soul is fine. And it hasn't, it hasn't lost anything more beautiful than where it's going. So uh, the, the problem of the death is the, for the people that, who, who feel the pain of that loss or the guilt yeah. of that loss or whatever they may feel. And the question is, can they overcome that? Overcome means to become, overcoming. overcoming means to be happy and healthy and creative again. To, come, to, to realize, to use this as a learning experience. There's nothing else going on in this empty reality. We established that yesterday, that this, this is not a reality, it's a creation of our minds. And these floors are 99.9% .9 empty and we're standing on them. So we're actually manifesting them mentally. And so the only thing that's going on here is a learning process. So we need to use everything as a learning process. Every pain, every suffering, every happiness, and every enjoyment, everything can be used as a learning process. By happiness, I can learn that I deserve happiness. And I can learn not to fear happiness. Because we also have lessons about, about accepting happiness. Okay? Uh, so uh, everything is learning. Because that's the purpose for which the soul has expressed itself on this level. For me, there are two reasons. One is to remember our true nature, which we have all forgotten to some degree. And secondly, to express our true nature in this reality. Now, there are other schools of thought that say that the second is not important. 
that only the first is important. For example, there's a book called The Course in Miracles. Have any of you come across that book? Uh, um, which says the only thing you have to do is wake up. You're just in a dream and you have to wake up. And you don't have to fix the dream. I'm obsessed with fixing the dream. <laughs> I like to fix the dream. <laughs> I want to make this dream more pleasant for all of us, okay? Personally, and then for your families, and then for society as, as we move out. Everything that you change in yourself will be reflected in your environment. And this is really the only power that we have, is, is to change yourself. So if you're asking what the purpose of life is, it's to remember who I am, and that's what I described earlier. I am love, I am worthiness, I am innocence, and I am safe and to express that here on the physical level. And there's another absolute for me that I would like to talk about, and then we'll move on to the techniques, and that is health. We all have perfect health. In the center of our, in center of our being, is, there is perfect harmony. Now, whether that perfect harmony or health arrives to the physical body or not is dependent on how we think, that's number one, and how we live, number two, okay? And especially how we think subconsciously. So there is this perfect health, which is not arriving at the physical, at the, at the energy level, at the mental level, energy level, and physical level. So what we need to do is to let go of the emotions, and you saw that yesterday on the film that I showed you, that people letting go of the emotions were able to be healed. Simply, and some of you experienced that also, that the pain in the back goes away. How was your arm? Was there any change? It's very good. It's very good, okay. So by letting go of some things, the, the energy of health comes into the body. And the emotions is the number one. Secondly, I would say food. To pay attention to the food, okay. And thirdly, the way we live, whether we exercise or breathe or how we sit and all these other details. But, Number one is, is the emotional level. So when I see a person, I don't see an ill person. I see a person who has perfect health and perfect happiness in the center of their being. And my work is to help them let go of whatever is causing that perfect mental health and physical health from arriving to their physical body. And I believe this is very important. Because I mentioned this yesterday, and this issue I have with the psychiatrists and some of the doctors, we're placing these labels on people, okay? Uh, and so, and I hope that you will also adopt this way of seeing, that behind every person with any kind of a problem, there is a perfect being. And you can be using whatever form of psychology or analysis or energy psychology, just to help that person come in touch with that. And I was actually lead, listening to one of the videos yesterday as I was coming. Um, I think the placebo effect has been proved in about 85% of the situations. That is, the placebo means that they were giving people sugar pills and telling them that there's just some kind of medicine, and the people were getting well. And there have been <coughs> very extensive uh, research on this. And the people are getting well because they believe they're taking a pill that's making them get well. And so the mind is doing it all. Okay? This is the importance also of energy, uh, energy work. If you want, at some point we can also, not at this seminar, but some future point, we can, I can do a weekend for you about how to direct your energy into people and to recreate their energy balance. So, various techniques on that. Okay, now, how did the problem get created then? What is the cause of the, of the problem? We, we, what I've, established, I've explained what I believe our true nature is, and now I want to talk a little bit about how the problem is created, and then what we can do to solve the problem. 2,500 years ago, there was a man named Patanjali. Patanjali has written the book called the Yoga Sutras. And he explains in five sentences the philosophy and the psychology of yoga. It's very simple. He says, 
the first cause of human disharmony, and that could be in the body or in the mind, is ignorance. The cause of human harmony is ignorance. Or we could say amnesia. <laughs> that is, the human is ignorant of his true nature, the nature that I just described. Okay? And then uh, he says, the second cause is identification. So we have this consciousness, this divine consciousness, which once it is, has created a physical body, starts expressing itself through that physical body, and when it does that, it forgets what it is and identifies with the body. It says, I am this body, I am this mind. It's like the, the, the electrical current coming through this light bulb and forgetting that it's the electrical current in all of the light bulbs, and then the sound system, and then the heating system, and saying, I am this light bulb. And then when it says, I am this light bulb, it looks around and sees another light bulb. That's a different thing from me. Okay? And then maybe that light bulb is shining more. Ah, I'm not so worthy because that light bulb is emitting more light. And then, oh, but I'm emitting more light than that light bulb, so I'm more worthy than that light bulb. And then, because the light bulb does have a certain duration of existence, oh, maybe I'm going to die. But the electricity was never the light bulb. It just thought it was the light bulb. And so we, as consciousness, expressing our through self through the body, we think we are the body, we think we are the mind, and then we fear rejection, and we fear death, okay? And then he says, the third cause is attachment. That all human suffering comes from attachment. We talked about this yesterday, okay? And we mentioned specific forms of attachment. Attachment for approval, attachment for security, for freedom, for control, and for pleasure also, attachments. And then the opposite of attachment is aversion. So we have attachment to some things and aversion to others. And he says, these four factors are the cause of all human suffering. Aversion means I don't want something to happen. I'm attached to health, I'm, I have an aversion to illness. I have an attachment to acceptance, I have an aversion to rejection. It's the same thing, really. Okay. Aversion, a, 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 aversion. You found it in Turkish? Okay. Okay. So, the problem, however, is increased by the fact that I, I don't just identify with the body, because if, I had, if my attachments were only based on the body, what would my attachments be? Food, <laughs> water, air, and some protection. It's an attachment with which most human beings are satisfied. Right? Uh, but the thing is, I'm not just attached to the body. What happens is, I begin to be attached, become attached to the roles that I am playing. Now, what's the first role that we play? Yeah. No, first role. Baby. You have to be a baby child. first. Okay, child. <laughs> okay, the first role that we play is I am the child. Now, what are my attachments in the role of the child? To the mother. What, what do I want from my mother? Love. I just don't want a mother. I want my mother love. to love me, to accept me, to approve of me. And if she doesn't do that, what do I feel? Pain, rejection, anger, hate, okay? Huh? Yeah, we, food we've established, okay. <laughs> we said the food, okay. Okay. So, immediately now, I have more attachments. And I don't say, okay, I can accept love from my aunt, or I'm okay if my neighbor loves me and accepts me or a thousand people accept me, it's not enough. Because I have placed this specific soul, which in a previous life could have been my child, or my husband or wife. Uh, this, if I, if I, that person doesn't accept me and approve of me, I can't feel okay. okay. And this is an attachment. 
And this is what we want to get free from. This is what we want to help other people get free from. We come with this. We don't come with this. Come no. With this. Forget that we... we learn this. Yeah. While we are a baby. Yeah, well, we have had pre previous experiences which cause us to, to make this association. But isn't it just normal to, ex to, to expect that from your mother? It's normal to expect it. It's proper for it to be there. But do we want our lives to be ruined if it's not? Okay? It's also normal to overcome it. I mean, at some point I have to cease being a child. I can't be 50 years old and still being upset because my mother didn't give me what I want when I was five years old. Okay? So at some point we have to let go of this stuff and that's what we're trying to do with this work. Okay? And then I have the attachment to the father okay, and what I need from my father. Okay, and so we want love and acceptance and support. And I don't know about Turkey, but some children are 35 years old and still want support. Yes. And the parents to cover them and to have, give them. And another thing in Greece is the parents have this thought for them, I have to give a house yes. to my yes. child. Yes. Okay. In America, we don't have that. No one, <laughs> no, no, no one ever gave me a house or anything really. Uh, so there are these thought forms and the children take this as well if my parents not giving me a house then I'm being done injustice to and how can I live my life and what we're doing actually is undermining the self-confidence of this being that he can create his own house you understand what I mean a lot of times giving inheritances to children is really undermining their own self uh, esteem and self-confidence okay so the first attachments come from the role of the child. And we want to let go of this. We're not children. We're divine beings. At least we're adults if we're not divine beings. And there, we, we don't need support. Okay. Now the second uh, role that we play is the role of the... Before, before you can become a parent, you have to become a spouse. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what we have is a spouse. We have a love partner. Now, what are our attachments from the love partner? What do we need from our love partner? Huh? Security. Love, acceptance. security, acceptance, support. To, to support, to do what we think he should do. <laughs> uh, we need him to be accepted by other people, mm -hmm. accepted by the society that we're in. And so if we don't get that, what do we feel? Angry. Angry, hurt, betrayed, sad. Okay, and we don't want him or her to pay attention to other people more than us. We, okay, so we don't want jealousy. The jealousy. Okay. And all of these emotions are created because I say that person has to give me this and if I don't have that from this person, I'm not worthy, or I'm not safe, and I can't be happy. And this is a creation of the mind. So Our self-worth has nothing to do... So what do we have to create? A reality in which we are loving, and being who we need to be, and not allowing our sense of self-worth and security to fluctuate depending on what the other person does or can do. There's a very interesting statement by uh, Eckhart Tolle in his book, The, the Power of the Now. Well, I'm not sure, maybe it was the second book, The, the New Earth, in which he says, Man's, you, mankind's greatest illusion is that someone in his past could have done something different than they did. It's an illusion if you believe that your parents could have done something different than they did with their programmings, with their fears, with their beliefs, and above all, with your soul contracts that you made in order to experience certain things, okay? Uh, it doesn't mean that they didn't do anything wrong. What it means is that they did the best they could with their illusions and their fears and their anxieties and their programmings, and the best that they could considering what we had decided to learn and our karmic relationships with them. Do you, you, you understand that? No? Okay. So as parents, when a newborn is coming to life, what should, how 
Yeah. Love. Love. Do, do to the child as you would like your parent to do to you. That's all. It's very simple. The, que the question is, we're not going to stop playing the roles. We're going to play the roles in the best way. I'm going to be the best child I can to my parents. I'm going to be the best spouse to my spouse that I can be. But I am not going to be dependent. Now, my emotional state depends on what the other is going to do. Okay? Uh, this is a, I have a, the, my last book is about, I call it the, the roles that we play as souls in evolution. And it's how we can play the same role as an ego or as a soul. So I can, many people play the role of the parent as an ego. I need to be verified through my children. And my self-worth is very much dependent on what's happening with my children. And that's not my purpose. We are not here to get self-worth by what the others are doing. We are here to play the role properly and not to be affected by what we are receiving back. It's a one-way street for me. Okay. Well, let's, let's, go, let's not go uh, through that now. Leave it for later. It sort of takes us in another direction. <laughs> Write it down, and at the end when I say, do we have any questions? Okay, thanks. Can I ask something? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, love is one-way street. Yeah. You love your child, or you love your, your spouse, parents, your parents, or yeah. your spouse, and you don't expect love back. You can ex so, okay, okay, let me make a clarification here. What we do in our seminars is we upgrade a, attachments to preferences. Okay? So I prefer that you love me. I prefer that you behave to me in ways which are fair and just. But if you don't do that, then I ask myself, okay, what is my lesson here? And my first lesson is to continue loving you. My second lesson may be to express what I need from you. That's another seminar. Effective communication. We don't know how to communicate, really. You said what upgrade, what? upgrade my attachment to a preference. So when I have an attachment, I cannot be happy if the attachment is not fulfilled. When I have a preference, I know what I want. I ask for it. I try to create it. But I, I can be okay. My my frame of reference is within myself. My self-worth is within me. And my security is within me. It's not going to be changed by what you're doing. Okay, so I prefer you to, you to behave to me with love, but I'm not going to feel I'm not worthy or insecure if you cannot. I see this as something that I have chosen to experience in order to learn something. Now, maybe I needed to learn to tell you I need you to love me and I don't like it when you don't. Okay, we need to also communicate and express the truth. And maybe it's to forgive you and understand you. Or maybe even to realize that I am perceiving this way out of proportion because I didn't receive love from my parents. And it's not, you're not the issue, my relationship with my parents is the issue. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. And then the third role that we play is the parent. Now the attachments. <laughs> How many of you are parents? Okay. Now, what are your attachments as parents? Loving, lasting. The child will love us and accept us. And he will be like obey us. Obey us. Obey us. <laughs> live their lives as in accordance to how we feel secure for them to live their lives, okay? In a way that we feel successful as parents. Hmm? And so we have many more, and they have to be healthy and happy and successful in life. And if this doesn't happen, we cannot be happy. Is it, what does this have to do with love? Needing all of these things from the child has nothing to do with love. I, I can love the child. It's an interesting statement by Bert Hellinger. Have you ever heard of him? He does the, um, um, what do they call it? The re constellations. He says, love means 
to want somebody to be happy in the way that they are guided from within to be happy. But we think that they know nothing. Exactly. <laughs> we think that they are, you know, empty. Okay. So exactly. This is our, our main problem is that we think that our children know nothing when they're divine beings that have incarnated thousands of times and are, are coming with great wisdom and we could learn so much from them. Yeah.